recording in progress. All right. Hello. Welcome, everyone. We are going to get started in just a moment. We've got a couple more folks drifting in, so we'll give them a, a minute or two, and then we'll, we'll get started. Okay, well, it looks like most folks are coming in, so I wanna, we have a big, full program for you today, so I wanna make sure we have time enough for to get through both the material and the questions. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Just so you all know, um, for your own benefit and, and for the benefit of your colleagues who couldn't be here today, the session is recorded and we'll be making the recording and slides available um, at um, a later date once that's all been posted. So um, thank you again. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Implementing Reparative Description for Indigenous Collections webinar, um, brought to you today by the Native American Archives section of the Society of American Archivists. Um, next slide. So this session is the second in SAA's identity series, a collaboration between multiple SAA sections to bring you webinars and discussion events that celebrate who you are as a person and an archivist and that showcase work done to create and promote equitable archives. So the first session in this series uh, was a joint effort between the Archivist and Archives of Color section in the Accessibility and Disability section. It was hosted on May 6th. And today, of course, you are, uh, you are um, at our webinar, at um, NASA's webinar, Implementing Preparative Description for Indigenous Collections. Um, additional sessions in this series are being planned for the summer, so please stay tuned. Um, we will communicate the dates and topics of these sessions via the NAS list serve, um, which is free to join, as well as our social media pages. Um, links are available on our SAA microsite page. Um, we'll drop a link to that in the chat in a moment. And the series coordinators will also be cross-posting announcements on other SAA listservs and listservs um, on external organizations, um, uh, li um, listservs and, and communication outlets. So we'll do our best to get the word out to you um, as we have it. Um, so next slide, please. So in today's session, we will, oops, let's go back one. Yeah, there we go. Um, so in today's session, we will cover um, a couple different topics. So first, we will define key concepts that including reparative description work, decolonization, and indigenization. Um, we will also discuss the importance of those, this work as well as its limitations. Um, we will then explore how two specific groups are approaching reparative description work and contextualize this work within broader conversations happening inside and outside of the archives field. Um, we will provide a list of additional resources that you can use to learn more. And we will, of course, have a Q&A at the end. So please add your questions to the chat and we'll get to as many as we can in the time that we have. Um, if you would prefer to submit your questions anonymously, we have um, a Google Doc that you can um, add your questions to that too. So that's totally fine. Um, we'll drop that link into the chat now as well. Uh, next slide. So before we go any further, we definitely wanna introduce our speakers. Um, so I am Rose Buchanan. I am the NAS chair this year and I'm a reference archivist at the National Archives in Washington, DC. I'm coming, you, coming to you today from um, Piscataway and Nashkoshtank traditional territory in Maryland. So Selena. Good morning from Alaska. I'm Selena ortega Shalero. I'm the NAS steering committee member and the museum specialist for Chicklin Village Traditional Council. I live and work on Matanuska Riverland, traditional homelands of the Atna and Denaina Dene. Hi everyone, I'm Nathan Sowery. I'm the reference archivist at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian. And I, like Rose, am also coming to you from, from Washington DC area, the traditional territory of the Piscataway and the Nacogdoches. Hi, I'm Eric Hong. I am the executive director of the Music of Asian America Research Center, and I'm coming from the Napi Hoking or unceded Lene Lenape territory, uh, which you might know as the suburbs, New Jersey suburbs of Philadelphia. I guess I should say next slide, please.
see. Oh. Monique, you might be muted. So hello, my name is Monique Tindall. I'm the tribal archivist for the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin. And I am a member of the Stockbridge Munsee Band of Mohegan Indians. And I live on uh, the traditional land of the Menominee and I work for the Menominee people. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Menyuk. I am a steering committee member of the Native American Archive section and I am the processing archivist at the National Museum of the American Indian Smithsonian Institution. And I am also coming to you from the traditional territory of the Piscataway and the Nacogdoches uh, peoples in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, hi everyone, I'm Diana Marsh. I am an assistant professor of archives and digital curation at the University of Maryland's College of Information Studies or iSchool. I'm also vice chair of the uh, Native American Archives section sponsoring today. Um, and I am also like my NARA and uh, Smithsonian colleagues beaming into you from the traditional territory of the Piscataway, Nikashtank and their indigenous kin and neighbors. All right, thank you, Diana. And I also want to thank Jackie Becky, who is running tech support for us behind the scenes today and who is another Nostian committee member. We couldn't be doing this without her. So big thanks to Jackie. Um, and now let's let's dive in. Um, so when we are discussing how when we were discussing how we wanted to approach this conversation, um, one of the things that we thought was really important to do was first define what we meant by reparative description, because there can be many different understandings of, of what this work is. Um, so SAA's Dictionary of Archives Terminology provides this basic definition that you see on the screen um, that is something that we can work off of. So according to it, um, reparative description is the remediation of practices or data that exclude, silence, harm, or mischaracterize marginalized people in the data created or used by archivists to identify or characterize archival resources. Uh, but while certainly useful for, for broadly outlining what we mean when we're saying the reparative description, this definition doesn't really provide us with a practical understanding of the changes we need to make to policies and practices to, to make reparative description happen. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Next slide. So here is a sort of visualization of different types of reparative description work that might help us expand on that basic definition. So at the top, you can see alerts, which refer to warnings about harmful language, either in historical records themselves or in legacy descriptions or in both. These warnings might appear in a processing note or on your repository's webpage or in a banner across your online catalog or all of the above. But the purpose of the alert is, of course, to acknowledge at the very least that your repository is aware of harmful language and its potential effects on users. But to really get at the reparative part of reparative description, uh, we of course have to go beyond just acknowledging the problem and actually work towards addressing it, right? So part of this involves examining overtly harmful terminology, such as racial slurs and stereotypical language in legacy descriptions. Um, strategies for addressing this terminology vary, of course, depending on the context, but the goal is to minimize harm and use communities preferred terminology whenever possible. Um, Rachel is actually going to talk further about this when she talks about NMAI's cultural thesaurus. Um, but reparative description is not just about addressing overtly harmful terminology. Um, it's also about addressing the ways in which our descriptive language and practices can more subtly exclude and silence marginalized communities. So this involves considering the larger context in which we describe collections, like which ones we're devoting resources to describing at all, and whose voices and experiences those collections represent. And it's working to identify and elevate collections related to marginalized communities that have previously been underdescribed and therefore effectively hidden. So Monique will talk about specific examples of liberating cultural knowledge from non-Indigenous archives and some of the work that she's done. So all of this takes an institutional commitment to reparative description, ideally codified in policy, so that it becomes a core responsibility of the repository in ethically caring for their collections. But the real foundation of this work and what underpins everything else I've said so far and what we'll see in our examples is collaboration with communities. That, that is the core and that is the foundation 
So to bring about sustained change is actually reflective of communities' needs and perspectives and preferences. You know, it's essential for repositories to build relationships with communities and partner with them in this work. So now I'll turn it over to Selena, who will talk a little bit more about how this fits into decolonization and indigenization in archives. Decolonization is the process of deconstructing colonialism ideologies of the superiority and privilege of Western thought and approaches. So what does this mean? Collective memory of imperialism has been perpetuated through the ways in which knowledge about indigenous people is documented, classified, and represented, just as Rose previously mentioned. For those of us who identify as indigenous, it still offends the deepest sense of our humanity. It assumes that you know all there is to know of us on the basis of brief encounters with only a small group of us. Colonization continues to extract and claim ownership of indigenous ways of knowing our cultural expressions and then simultaneously reject and disregard source communities and deny them further opportunities to be creators of their own nations. By breaking down these barriers, we can allow alternative perspectives and ways of knowing to merge which can provide us a broader understanding of our world and the people who live in it. Following this, indigenization is the process of naturalizing indigenous knowledge systems and making them evident to transform spaces, places, and hearts. Indigenization really occurs after decolonization. Indigenization does not mean changing something Western into something indigenous. The goal is not to replace Western knowledge with indigenous knowledge, nor merge them into one. Indigenization is understood to be a weaving where both distinct knowledge systems are braided together so that learners can come to understand and appreciate both. It is deliberate and meaningful. To summarize, decolonization is a component of indigenization, challenging the dominance of Western thought and bringing indigenous thought to the forefront. It is important to note that both decolonization and indigenization are ongoing processes that have no formulated approach, meaning there is not only one way to accomplish their goals, but rather they are defined by the individuals and communities who seek to create more equitable and healthy practices and spaces. Thank you, Selena. Can we get, thank you, Jackie. Okay, so I'm back and I'm going to speak very quickly about some of the positives or the benefits to implementing reparative description. Foremost among these, most apparently, is that reparative description provides an opportunity for collaboration between colonial institutions and native communities. This type of collaboration opens the door to using culturally appropriate and accurate language, thus hopefully repairing, at least to some extent, the historically fraught relationships between archives and indigenous peoples. Importantly, we should not conceive of reparative description simply as cultural heritage repositories unilaterally dictating what they want to Native communities. The two should be working together. In fact, as Monique will discuss in a few moments, a number of tribal archives, libraries, and museums are currently using collaborative curation models to develop processes to implement this type of work. If done respectfully and in collaboration with Native communities, Reparative description enhances the value of resources for all users. And with that, I will now pass it along to Eric, who will identify some of the limitations to reparative description. Thank you, Nathan. So reparative description is something that you should definitely do, uh, but it is definitely not the only thing you should do. Um, and in many ways, reparative description is a good, very good first step. It looks at a lot of the surface uh, problems that, that you have. But reparative description often does not look at some of the underlying issues. It does not deal with the ethical issues which are related to the creation of the collection. So if the collection was created to justify boarding schools, for example, um, you know, reparative description cannot change that. Uh, it does not change the colonial views embedded in many collections. Uh, reparative subscription is also not reparation and it does not resolve ethical problems about how the archives acquired the collection. 
Uh, repair of description, uh, as, as Nathan said, often involves a lot of community building, uh, but it doesn't always address issues of power and it doesn't always address issues of access and use. Uh, and most importantly, reparative subscription by itself doesn't necessarily benefit indigenous groups represented in the collection. So um, again, reparative description is something that you should definitely do, but it is not the one step that will solve all your problems. So now uh, we will go to examples of how to do reparative description and I'll pass it on to Monique. So some of the reparative description work that um, has been happening at the Menominee Tribal Archives first started when I was accepted into the 2019-2020 Tribal Digital Stewardship Cohort Program, which was an IMLS funded project facilitated by the Center for Digital Scholarship and Curation at Washington State University in Pullman. Part of my work in the TDSCP program was to research Menominee materials in external repositories to prepare, prepare for our third training session that was to occur in Washington, DC. So my initial, no, my initial research included using the online catalogs and also during my remote and on-site research, I noticed that the way in which Native American archival materials are described by external repositories can actually make it difficult for Indigenous researchers and community members because we use community-based vocabularies and names of community members to describe and research our materials, no matter which repository they're, they're, they're housed in. So if you're a Native American a uh, researcher, you already have to go into these catalog and these catalog systems, knowing the names of these non-indigenous ethnographers and which ethnographers uh, worked with which tribal communities. So it is important for archivists to remember that the primary audience that research and access Native American archival materials are Native Americans and indigenous peoples. So it is logical to create descriptive processes that align the values and methods in which we research and we research our materials and also the ethics and how we describe our cultural heritage not, uh, materials and our cultural knowledge. So one way that the descriptions could be improved is to list the names of Indigenous people at the collection level because Indigenous researchers are looking for those names of prominent language speakers, of leaders, and family members. So actually finding a way to list their names will actually improve access. So after my initial research, I, I had reached out to the NAA archives to request the full finding aid in preparation for when I would actually go to DC. And buried within that 27 page document, I actually found the name of each of the speakers. They were listed within the title description of each individual story um, within Bloomfield's handwritten notebooks. So while I was there, the reading room rules did not permit me to bring in my own overhead scanner, but I was allowed to photograph them. So because these stories, they're unpublished, they don't have any translations by Bloomfield, I immediately knew that this was a valuable resource to our Menominee language speakers and that with um, our Mukadu practice site, I could get these stories into the hands of the speakers faster and create descriptions for the materials that reflected the values of Menominee peoples. So when you, you're working with a or in a tribal archive library museum, you're, you're already in a race against time because you don't know how long you're your culture bearers are going to be around. Most of them are elders. And then with considering the health disparities in our communities, like we're also um, not too sure what the life expectancy for our adult culture bearers are going to be. And during the time when I was doing the research was just the beginnings of the global COVID-19 pandemic. So with this being in the back of my mind, I knew I had to collect as much as I could and bring it back to the community, not knowing um, you know, how the pandemic was gonna affect our community and trying to get as much um, knowledge um, and individuals working with these, 
these um, these photographs of the stories um, it, as soon as possible. Next slide. So in the spring of this year, I was I had a, a partnership with um, the the um, Tribal Libraries, Archives, and Museums course taught at the University of Wisconsin Madison School for Library and Information Science. And because of the COVID-19 pandemic, I had to create a project that could be done remotely. So I applied what I learned in the TDSCP program and created a, a, collab a collaborative curation model that could provide guidance for students and how to work respectfully and effectively with the tribal archives. And this model um, is centered around the Menominee clan system and the uh, relevance that um, the white pine tree has to the Menominee community and its ties to the Menominee clan system. So that's why we used this imagery when we were creating this model. So also, we, I had to create a internal process for reparative description. So the reason why I developed this is because I needed something to guide the students to be able to read and interrogate archival descriptions of Menominee materials in external institutions using critical race and decolonial research theories. So this is where I see an intersection between um, indigenous research practice, indigenous researchers, indigenous uh, evaluators, um, being a community that could really help inform uh, alms and also archivists with Native American materials because a lot of their work is like includes providing the framework of how we look at material, how we look at information and how we how we describe it. And so because the Menominee Tribal Archives uses the traditional knowledge labels to communicate uh, how, commu how the community wants their cultural heritage to be used, it was logical to create a, repair a reparative description process um, that addressed how the community wants to be represented. So one important process that I'll mention here today is questioning whether the material um, content and the descriptions in the collections have been verified by the community. And this is gonna require collaboration and partnership with, um, with the TALM and with the tribal nation that, um, is, that the archival material are attributed to. So for myself, um, I rely on my elders at um, Historic Preservation, the Menominee Cultural Museum, uh, Menominee Language and Culture Department and Menominee U. So partnerships and collaborations, they need to be based on reciprocity, mutual understanding, and respect with alms and tribal nations. It is essential, th these are part of the first steps when you're planning a reparative description project. Next slide. So while creating the item level descriptions for each story, the TLAM students learned how to incorporate Menominee values into various fields of description. And this included using Menominee language in descriptive fields, acknowledging culture bearers as the true creators of the stories and noting Bloomfield for his, contribu for his contribution in documenting them. And we also, um, feel that it's important to acknowledge the rights of the Menominee people over their own cultural heritage material. So this project has, has met the next phase where the tribal archi archives will be creating people files. And by tribal archives, I mean myself because I am a loan arranger. Um, so we're creating those, pe I'm creating those people files in Mukudu and collaborating with language speakers to incorporate translations and cultural, cultural narratives. So towards the end of the project um, that included the TLAM students, a photograph of John and Joseph Satterley was found 
while I was processing a donation from the Martha Elizabeth Curtis family. So to find a photograph of the speakers by chance was humbling because it is a reminder. And especially uh, for non-Indigenous archivists, archivists who do not work within a tribal community, it is important to remember that Indigenous and Native American archival materials are not about the ethnographers who completed the documentation or the institutions that collected them. It is about the individuals who allowed their knowledge to be written, recorded, and photographed in hopes that it would be treated with respect and will one day come back to their descendants. They did this despite the imposition of federal Indian assimilation laws, and they were the resistors of their day. And for cultural heritage professionals, they are our heroes. And for Native sovereign nations, they are the national treasures. But most importantly, they are the great grandparents, the uncles and the aunties of people today. Next slide. Thank you so much, Monique, for sharing this project. And um, I'm looking forward to, to speaking with you more about you know, how, how to maximize these, um, the, how to highlight the, the names in our, in our collections as well, because that's a project I'm really interested in. So jumping ahead to our example number two, the National Museum of the American Indo Indian Culture Thesaurus. Uh, my name is Rachel Menyuk. I have been the processing archivist at NMAI since 2010, and I'm going to be giving you a little bit of the background and development of the Culture Thesaurus, its implementation, in the Archive Center and then on a very recent merge project with the National Anthropological Archives. So to begin, I, I thought it was really important to talk about how doing this work, doing reparative description work really does need to be implemented at a, at a higher level. You know, it needs to be part of the policy that you do. So I thought I would share this very a small snippet from NMAI's uh, recently updated collection management policy, and it reads, and I'm going to do that thing where I'm just going to read off the slide. The NMAI and its policies, including this collections management policy, address responsible and ethical stewardship of Native collections in collaboration and partnership with Native and Indigenous peoples, while also considering the Smithsonian's mandate for the diffusion of knowledge widely accepted standards of museum practice and the professional ethics of staff members who carry out NMAI's mission. Overall, NMAI works in concert with all interested parties to arrive at stewardship solutions that privilege native values and perspectives. And a really important part of privileging native values and perspectives is how we describe these collections, how we steward these collections through description and access. Next slide, please. So one of the ways NMAI has been tackling this for a very long time, um, well, not, I guess, in the history of museums, not a very long time, but since 2006, uh, the NMAI collections and photograph archives have been um, using EMU, which is NMAI's collections management system. It was implemented in 2006. And when EMU was implemented, it was decided that the thesaurus module would be implemented to organize culture terms hierarchically. In addition to providing control terminology, which was desperately needed at the time, the thesaurus model allowed misspellings and non-preferred terms to be designated as invalid. And the thesaurus would automatically replace derogatory misspelled culture names with appropriate and valid terms. And these terms were um, created in consultation with native communities. And, um, and the, the, a really important thing to note about the culture thesaurus, and I'll emphasize it as we go along, they were created a, around NMAI's collection. So that it, it is not an exhaustive thesaurus. It's not representative of every single community in the Americas. It's representative of NMAI's collections. And the culture terms in EMU in the collections database are used for culture of manufacture, who created 
the object, the materials, the culture of use, who used it, culture of subject, so who is represented in photographs, for instance, and then they're also linked to party or person records. And in such cases as um, where legal names of tribes, such as the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, are used to identify artists and individuals, where tribal nations have stipulated that only enrolled tribal members are entitled to be identified by that tribal name. So things like um, these uh, stipulations are, you know, discussed um, at a sovereign to sovereign level, and um, these are very important to the NMAI. Next slide, please. So here's just a little example of um, a table of some terms so you can see how they are um, created hierarchically. We have six levels, levels four through six, privileged use of self-designated culture terms. Uh, you'll see levels one through three are more geographically related. And you would be able to do a search in EMU, uh, you know, under planes and find all of the terms that are underneath of it, or you could search more specifically for, you know, uh, Lakota or Hongpapa Lakota, or even within Standing Rock and find those materials. You'll also see that they're is a table section for invalid synonyms. So if you happen to search for that synonym, you would find the preferred term. And we also do have room for language information in the thesaurus. Um, next slide, please. And I did want to actually, I want to mention that EMU is a relational database. So these terms are able to be linked to one another, which is going to be important information to remember as I move into talking about archive space. So the Archive Center, which is a part of NMAI's collections, was originally divided into three different collections, the paper archives, the photo archives, and the media archives. Now the photo archives, because they were item level catalog, they were part of this EMU um, uh, integration back in 2006. So item level catalog photographs went into EMU, but the rest of the archive center collections did not, the paper archives and the media archives. When I was hired in 2010 to begin um, putting our paper archive collections into Archivist Toolkit, these were still separate collections. But over the course of several years, the archive center decided that actually it is one archive, it is one collection, and we need to start describing our all of our collections uh, in the same place, right? And so we started to um, write collection level records and finding aid for these photo collections. It's still an ongoing process, taking item level photos and contextualizing them. And as we were doing this in Archivist Toolkit, um, we realized that, you know, we had this really amazing, rich culture data in EMU that wasn't that didn't exist in Archivist Toolkit at the time. All we had been using were Library of Congress subject headings, and not only did we find that they were inappropriate for the mandate of our museum, they just they don't provide the kind of access and research and discoverability that we really wanted for these collections. So around 2014 the Archive Center began piecemeal adding uh, our culture of this worst terms into Archivist Toolkit as local terms. And we talked to our, you know, our AT folks and they said, sure, go ahead and do it. But we were sort of adding them in little bit by little bit as we were processing collections. We'll fast forward a few years to 2017, the Smithsonian as a whole migrates over to Archive Space. And when we do this, we begin to have conversations with um, our archive space person, Nancy Kennedy, about can we ingest the whole culture of thesaurus from EMU into archive space? And the, the, the short answer is yes, we can do it. There are a few things we want to do first. One of them is we wanted to apply for a Library of Congress subject source code, which we did in May of 2020. Uh, we applied for a source code, which we received, and um, there is a link to the, uh, you know, if if you don't know where to find the LOC source codes, there's a whole list of them. Ours is NMAICT. I do want to emphasize that a source code does not mean that all of the items within this thesaurus are now LOC subject headings. That's not how it works. It just means that this vocabulary is recognized as a valid vocabulary. So once that was complete, we did a full ingest of the entire NMAI culture thesaurus into archive space, which also meant because 
um, all of the archival units and some of the uh, special collections and libraries at Smithsonian use archive space, it meant that now the NMAICT was accessible to all of those archival units across the Smithsonian. Um, there, I, there are some limitations, next slide please, in archive space. Um, so this is what a um, culture term looks like in archive space. Um, and right now we do include, include a scope note, which shows the hierarchy, you know, from that table uh, you saw a few slides ago, there were those six levels. Well, we've sort of flattened the hierarchy into a scope note so that at least if you search, you know, Northern Plains, you would still be able to find all the information, but a space is not relational in the same way that uh, that EMU is. So the, the terms aren't linked in the same way. There is no used for field. So one of the things I mentioned talking about uh, EMU is the invalid field would show up with your preferred term. We don't have that in archive space right now. Um, and we don't have the additional language notes. And of course, the, 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 the greatest limitation right now is that the systems don't talk to one another. So any updates being made to EMU need to be manually updated in archive space, which is something we're working on so that I don't constantly have to make updates. Despite these limitations, this, this thesaurus greatly improves discoverability and searchability in our collections. And in, not only are we making it easier for researchers and particularly native and indigenous research members to locate their materials at NMAI, by having it at the Smithsonian, we're making it easier for folks to locate materials across units at the Smithsonian. Next slide, please. Um, oh, I just wanted to show sort of how we use an archive space. So we will often tag, uh, culture terms at the collection level. So um, for instance, in this Frank Speck collection, uh, there are many, many culture terms at the collection level. We'll do it at series and subseries levels. And in some cases, when we have item level cataloging in a collection, we will also include culture terms at the item level. Next slide, please. So once the whole thesaurus was in archive space, Folks at the National Anthropological Archives, which are part of the Smithsonian, part of the Natural History Museum, reached out to us and, and we had a long conversation and they were very interested in merging some of their outdated terms into NMAI CT's preferred terminology. Um, next slide, please. So this was a fairly large undertaking. Uh, we began in November of 2020, we ended in January of 2021, and by ended I mean we finished phase one because there's still quite a lot of work to do. Um, I worked with uh, Daisy Ninjoku at the National Anthropological Archives with Nick Hamilton, who was Archive Center intern, and we worked with folks in our OCIO department over seven work days to go through uh, alphabetically all the culture terms using Open Refine, research which ones matched up, and um, we were able to merge 1,620 headings into 465 preferred terms. And I, I, I don't need to read all the numbers here, but um, we updated you know, almost 2,500 finding aids that are now available through Collection Search Center, which is the Smithsonian's overall collection search uh, database and through the SOVA, which is Smithsonian Online Virtual Archive. So it was a really, massive undertaking, but greatly rewarding that the, that the work was um, able to, part one of the work was complete. There's, like I mentioned, there's a lot of work to do. Um, the NAA has a numerous uh, collections that encompass communities that the NMAI does not have terms for, because as I mentioned earlier, we are thesaurus right now, only encompasses terms from collections that the NMAI has. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? Um, as always, we are all continuously, the, the thesaurus is continuously being updated from based on requests from tribal communities, changes in legal names of tribes, ref refinement on archeological interpretations. And, and so it's a work in progress. And so finding ways to make that accessible to not just folks in the Smithsonian, but outside of the Smithsonian really means that we need to find an online home. So I know that's gonna be the first question, where can I find this thesaurus? Well, currently it doesn't have a home online, which we're really working on getting soon. So right now, if you want access to thesaurus, which you can have, 
you would need to contact us and we would send you a CSV file, which is, you know, a giant Excel with all of the terms. And that, of course, can't be updated over time. So we are working on that. We're reaching out to other Smithsonian units for similar merge projects. And um, we're, you know, presenting on the thesaurus. I also want to mention that, you know, NMAI is not the only, um, it's not the, we're not the only place doing this kind of work in, in your resources that I think Diana is going to be talking about shortly. There are some other wonderful examples of thesauri being created by um, by other, um, by tribal archives, by other, um, by other museums. And um, with that being said, I'm gonna say next slide, please. Um, thank you so much, uh, Monique and Rachel, for those wonderful um, examples um, from the community perspective and from the institutional perspective. Um, in concluding this presentation, um, we wanted to acknowledge that Reparative description, as Rachel just mentioned, is part of a lot of broader, um, broader global movements, broader initiatives, broader work going on, um, both in and beyond the archives field. So first, um, that it's an ethical practice that stems from wider, for instance, repatriation movements and policies, and we've linked a number of examples of some of those documents here. It's part of broader movements in indigenous sovereignty, Black Lives Matter, efforts in language revitalization, and of course, um, community archiving and participatory archiving movements. Uh, next slide. Um, and if you want to learn more about reparative description more broadly and other approaches to reparative description in different um, community and institutional contexts, uh, we've listed some resources. And um, as Rose mentioned in the chat, we'll be posting uh, both this recorded presentation and these slides so folks have um, access to all of these links. Um, and we especially want to call out the anti-racist description resources from the Archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia. Um, and But all of these are really wonderful, um, really powerful documents and very implementable um, policy documents that you can use in your own context. Next slide. Um, specifically for working in reparative description with Native First Nations and Indigenous collections, um, there are lots of emerging texts and projects, the SORI, um, copyright resources, um, lots of different resources for thinking through responsible naming and community-based subject headings and terminologies, best practices. Um, so we've done our best to compile some of those resources here and some uh, really good examples of those efforts, many of which include um, the SORI of the kind that Rachel was just discussing. Next slide. Um, and of course, as Selena alluded to, and as Eric spoke about, um, you know, archives are inherently colonial institutions. Um, we know we can't decolonize archives full stop, but um, there are, is a great growing literature on decolonizing practices, decolonizing methodologies, um, and that ongoing work and weaving that Selena spoke about, um, and lots of different ways to incorporate that into our work and into our ways of, of knowing in our different institutions. Um, so we can make headway at reparative practice and reciprocal community relationships. Um, so we've compiled a list of resources we hope will be useful in that vein as well. Next slide. All right, so thank you everyone. Thank you all of our presenters. Um, we will dive into questions now. We're just as a reminder, you can drop your questions in the chat or add them to the anonymous Google Doc. I know we've got some activity in the in both the chat and the doc right now. Um, so we will get to as many questions as we can. Um, I see that there is um, one question in uh, the chat on what would be the email to reach out for for that NMAI Excel spreadsheet. And Rachel dropped the, um, her email in the in the chat. Um, so Minyuk R at si.edu. Um, Rachel, we have another question and while we're on the subject of NMAI uh, for you. Um, is the effort NMI, NMAI went through especially the reason for keeping both EMU and archive space documented and available? Can you, can you repeat that question one more time, Rose, for me? Sure. Um, is the effort NMAI went through especially the reason for keeping both EMU and archive space documented and available? 
And if you need more context, maybe we can um, ask the person who wrote that question to add a little bit more into the Google Doc and we can come back to it. Yeah. So there, uh, in terms of documentation, um, we do have documentation into the creation of the, cult, of the culture thesaurus in relation to EMU. Um, and um, it is something that we provide to, to folks who are interested, especially whenever we send, if someone asks for the thesaurus, we'll send the thesaurus along with the background documentation on how and why it was created. So um, we're happy to provide that to anyone. Um, in terms of archive space and um, the, the, pro the documenting the process, it hasn't, since it's so recent, nothing's really been written up about it. These Presenta this presentation today is sort of the first time we've really even discussed it. So um, I don't really have anything that sort of lays out how what's what's been done. Um, uh, interesting, but the decision making process. Hmm. Yeah, for you know, for the the decision making process for implementing it into archive space was just um, you know we. We wanted to be our the, the archive center wanted to emphasize that we for a long time had been seen as separate from collections that archives and collections were not on the same level and by implementing a lot of the same standards and terminology I think it, it really helped to. Um, not just for the staff, but for for everyone else to look at archives um, as part of NMAI's collections and that it's just as important to describe archival materials, you know, as ethically and with as much care as um, object collections. Um, so I, I that, at least for me, that was one of the reasons we really pushed to, to make this change in archives, because I think oftentimes it's sort of archives are seen as secondary to collections in the museum world. And we've been really trying to change that perspective a lot at, at the museum. I don't know if that answers your question at all either. Thank you, Rachel. And we will, um, before we end, um, include our, our contact information if you all think of um, additional questions and you want to follow up with us. So, so don't worry, the, the conversation can continue. Um, we have a few questions about Library of Congress subject headings, so I'll, I'll jump to them. This will be just open, of course, to, to anyone, uh, any of our, presentator, our presenters. Um, so the first question, as far as LCSH, Library of Congress subject heading, goes, is, quote, Native Americans preferred over, quote, Indians of North America in similar subject headings? Yes, out of the two, I would definitely go with Native Americans because we're not from India. I would have to second that with Monique, but I can also say too, every tribal community is completely different and some prefer certain terminology over others. So I would say in regards to your collections at your institutions, um, you might want to contact the indigenous group that your collections represent and get feedback from them to see how they like to be identified. Okay. Thank you both. And um, kind of on a, a related note, we have another question. What is the impact on general discoverability of using custom authorities as opposed to say LC, Library of Congress subject headings that may not be the preferred term? Um, so for my institution, we have a cultural term using Ojibwe, the LC term of Ojibwe Indians and inscriptions or other description that just use Ojibwe at a different, various different spellings in that example. Uh, that's a great question. And, um, you know, in, in, in certain cases, we do include sort of non preferred terms, but um, ones that aren't derogatory or offensive in parentheses in our culture terms for that very purpose so that uh, when you know searches are being done, it does help to find them. But I also wanna emphasize that in a lot of our database systems, you know, the, the culture terms, any subject heading, any name heading, any of those sort of you know, search terms are just secondary to what you're actually describing in the finding aid. At least that's how it works in our collection search database. It's doing keyword searching across the entire uh, the entire collection record across the entire finding aid. So all those search terms are really great for narrowing your search in a large database setting. 
it's going to find any term that you have described anywhere in the finding aid. Um, again, I can't speak for everyone's database or everyone's system, but like, you know, the idea of like Google searching now with keywords as opposed to just search terms, I think is is starting to be more used across the board um, in all of our systems. So yes, it is important for discoverability and research to have, you know, some of the, the terms that had been previously used, but privileging them in certain places versus others. That's, you know, that's where for us using appropriate terminology is being privileged in that in that subject heading. I don't know if that that makes sense or answers your question. Thank you, Rachel. I thought that was that was nice and detailed. Um, we have a couple of scenarios now we will get to as well. So um, stick with me, presenters, on these. Um, um, the folks who asked them gave some wonderful context. So the first one, um, I work in a state archives and I'm going to be processing, quote, the Indian papers, end quote. Um, these papers are about all tribes in the state and are mostly about removing or fighting, quote, the savages. Yikes. Um, I don't know the best way to refer to these indigenous people. It's not really feasible to refer to each tribe as there are many tribes. There's actually a book called, quote, The Indian Papers from the 1960s that works as an index for these papers. I can't change the name of the book, but I'm hoping to use some better language in the finding aid. Um, these papers are mostly from the mid to late 19th century. So what would be our advice for this person? I'm wondering what they mean by like how many because this could be an opportunity to get everybody on Zoom and consult with them on how what their feelings are about this and how they would like it to be described. Um, and then also putting a, a like a, a notification that the material material um, that um, contains racial slurs. Any other thoughts from our presenters? I'll just Thank chime you. in that I think starting small is okay too. So you have to start somewhere and sometimes bigger things can be built from starting with something manageable. And so there are local communities or communities that you can start to build relationships with and then work out um, rather than to say, oh, it's too big, <laughs> you know. Thanks, Monique. Thanks, Diana. Um, we have another scenario. So again, presenters, stick with me. Um, we recently accessioned a small set of reports from an archaeological survey that was done during the 1930s. Some archaeologists dug up, photographed, and tracked information and geolocation information about our local indigenous communities' burial grounds and sacred sites. The geo coordinates could be incredibly important for local indigenous groups to know about the locations of their sacred and burial sites. Today, these communities are dispersed, not federally recognized, and it's unclear how we might address this collection and its needs. Based on local programs and engagement, it appears that the local indigenous groups are not mutually collaborative or in agreement about knowledge sharing, so there are many potential stakeholders. Repatriation slash deaccessioning is an option, but we don't know where to go, and we know that the local groups would not want the surveys taken out of the region. Currently, we've just published the finding aid based on the accession record, but we are restricting access until we figure out what to do. What do you think about this plan? We are considering making a targeted announcement to all the indigenous groups and leaders we can find and limiting access to these groups using a remote slash limited digital access system, then gathering input on disposition and determining whether to allow public access or deaccessioning based on the input of these stakeholders. So thoughts from our presenters. They're not giving us easy questions, are they? Um, I, def I would definitely think, I definitely think consultation is a good step and that's kind of what you're describing. Um, I think you should also, I, I caution you in um, when you say about, they're not all federally recognized. Um, federal recognition is a colonized construct. And for some tribes, um, it's 
been a huge barrier to getting access because they are not federally recognized. It does not mean that they are not an organized community and it does not mean that they do not have their own and are not allowed to empower themselves by exerting their sovereignty. So I would say you should leave that federal recognition at the door when you're consulting and working with tribes. Um, and I definitely think um, expressing that you acknowledge that there should be some limitations in access is a good step because it shows that you recognize that. Um, gosh, I don't know, Monique, what do you think? <laughs> this would be a great conversation for our group. <laughs> yes, definitely. And I agree with Selena as well. And um, so I know like with, with geolocation, um, you want to be really careful with that and just limit those geolocations to each individual tribal community. Now, say if multiple tribal communities share cultural affiliation with a single site, that's something where all of them are going to have to consult with one another and they have to come to an agreement what they wanna decide on as far as like, do they want the geolocations? Do they want um, those to be accessed just in the finding aid that has access for them? Um, do they want shared access if it's a site that has shared cultural affiliation, like shared access to those geolocations? So that's sort of like, I could foresee there being like a multi, uh, different tiers of consultation where it's like consultation between tribal communities and the institution and then consultation between tribal communities because one thing that unfortunately repaid um, NAGPRA and has caused um, is where institutions want to want to like just give it to one tribe rather than encouraging and then put the tribes end up getting put in a hard position where they're pitted against each other. And so what you want to do is you want to be supportive and um, encourage like collaboration between all of you, like between institution and tribes and collaborations between the tribes themselves. So that's where you're really gonna have to think about your language that you're using because some language could be triggering. Um, so um, that's where you're gonna have to really study and look at the impact that repatriation have had, has had on communities. And then also um, ask questions, come from a learning place, um, be honest. And like, if you don't know something, ask the question, ask for help, and they'll do their best to help you out and to um, help you to understand like where they're coming from. And um, it's really important to protect those geolocations because we also think about the protection of those sites. You know, there's, there's looters out there. So that's where you wanna make sure that your site's really secure and that someone can't hack in there and um, extract that information. So that's another thing that will have to be determined um, with the tribal communities as far as like how comfortable they feel with having that in a on a digital platform. That was really great, Monique. Yeah, I agree absolutely with everything you said. Um, I think um, maybe something you're also not aware of is um, some sites are only privy to certain members of tribal of the tribal community, not the entire tribal community. So um, I think that's where Monique's um, advice about consulting and making sure you're consulting with somebody from each of those groups is really important. Um, so you can gauge on how their community works and what is considered sacred and what is considered only accessible to designated members of um, those communities. Um, I can honestly say for, for our tribe, um, we're Atna Dene, but there's several Atna groups. And although some sites are important to several Atna groups, 
they're not important to all of them. So because of that, we actually don't disclose a lot of our geosites um, because of that. It's kept within our tribal communities and our council dictates who has access to that information. Thank you, Selena. Thank you, Monique. Um, that was a, a complicated question and you all, um, I think, gave some really great advice. Um, so we are, we're getting, presenters, we're getting a lot of kudos in the chat to you all. Um, so thank you for your great work. And we are at time right now at five, but if folks are willing to stick with us, we only have a few more questions that I think we can um, go ahead and answer. And again, if you've got to go, totally understand, we'll get the recording out. Um, a really brief SAA question we had um, is, is there a um, working group on reparative description for folks who are maybe new to this topic? And right now, I don't think there's a specific working group for reparative description, but certainly we um, NOS work on it and um, there's a SAA description section that is engaged in this work and many other SAA, SAA sections um, are pursuing um, this work collaboratively. Um, so if you have, if you are looking for resources, again, we'll share these slides and can be a source to get you started, um, but we can also hopefully put you in, in touch with other folks who are working on them. Um, couple more questions for our presenters. Um, I work with a small all-volunteer historical society. Does anyone work with a similar group that has done a full archives review to identify materials that need reparative description? I'm sort of an audit of archival description um, kind of case studies. Or would have resources um, supporting that. I can say briefly that um, maybe we can get this link in the chat as well. Um, NAS has done um, some work with um, implementing the protocols for Native American archival materials, and part of that has been uh, putting forth some some guidance and resources related to doing a cultural audit. Um, so maybe if we can put our link to our Sustainable Heritage Network community page in the chat, um, that can maybe get the folks who asked that question um, started on that topic. So let me see, I wanna make sure we get to everything else. Um, we had one more question, oh, did I hear? The representative's unmuting. We had one more question about how might archives approach the issue of needing to repair the descriptions while perhaps also retaining old versions for the sake of transparency about past descriptive practices or past inaccuracies. Um, I think Rachel, your response earlier kind of um, starts getting to that. Um, I was just gonna add one other thing that we do, you know, we do maintain all of the original catalog cards for like our item level photo, photo collections. You know, we don't throw them away and say, this catalog card has uh, inaccurate information, why? I mean, we, we, we do maintain the history of um, how our collection was originally cataloged in old museum. And um, it's just, that might not be the, the information we initially provide to our researchers so that they can, you know, locate our, our collections. And um, as the Smithsonian folks come to us as, the, as a source, right? As you know, they look to the Smithsonian as um, as you know a um, authoritative knowledge source, and so we it is in our mandate to provide information um, that we feel is responsible and ethical. All right, well, thank you. And Rachel, and um, with that, I think that we've gotten to all of our questions. Again, presenters were getting a lot of kudos, so um, great job to you all. Um, Jackie, if we can go to the next slide, you'll see our contact information. If you all have specific questions for us, um, you are welcome to reach out to any of us. Um, our main NAS email address, nativearcsaa at gmail.com is also there. Um, so thank you all for spending this time with us. We are so glad you joined us, and um, we hope to continue connecting with you about this work. Thanks.